Hi, my name is Sid Gore, and this presentation is on systems engineering in aerospace and defense, its history and its trends to see where the industry is going in the near future. So to start off with, we'll ask ourselves, what is systems engineering? Um, and then we'll ask how the approach has developed in the aerospace and defense industries since its inception. We'll go into a few studies selected for aerospace and defense and then extrapolate the future trends. After this, we'll discuss briefly some opportunities for further research, depending on what was found during the literature review. And at the very end, we'll wrap it up with some implications for college education and implementation in industries. Systems engineering as defined by the International Council on Systems Engineering, which is the governing body, is the transdisciplinary and integrative approach to engineering and as such, it's not really a certain group of engineers, but you could have a mechanical background, an electrical background, a computer science background, but you could be working in systems engineering because it's a discipline of putting all these things together to, in the end, come up with a solution for a complex system that works and meets requirements. This is the famous systems engineering V approach, and you'll see that there's two legs, one on the way down. On the left side is at the very top, you will define your prototype uh, concept, your concept of operations. Then you will go on to define at the very top level, the requirements that you have for the system. And this could be a uh, software, it could be a machine, it could be an airplane, it could be a small transistor. And so, you know, this is the, the overall approach to how you would go about designing um, these objects. You would then break that system lower into smaller levels called subsystems and then do requirements for those as well. And then you would do detailed design for those subsystems. Um, afterwards, after you implement it, you go up the right side of this V in which you're verifying that the requirements on the subsequent left side of the V have been verified. And as you go higher and higher, eventually you get to a point where your system is validated. Um, and that's when you put it in the field. And you know, it, depending on what you're doing, it could be a cyclical approach. In order to understand where systems engineering came about from, we'll take a closer look at how exactly it started and why, which is a pretty interesting story. In 2020, this year, Hussein et al. conducted a review and analysis of systems engineering history, and we'll be using his division of three different intervals. And the intervals that were suggested were um, an introductory phase until 1960, an exploratory phase between 1961 and 1989, and then a revolution phase between 1990 and 2017. And something to note is that Gord et al. in a separate study found that World War II was really instrumental to the emergence of system engineering because as countries, especially the United States, were developing more and more complex systems, it was harder to keep track of the different requirements and make sure that all these machineries were still usable in the field by the operators. And so it kind of naturally evolved out of that need. In interval one, which we refer to as the introductory phase, systems engineering was embedded in engineering projects, not a separate discipline. In fact, it goes back all the way to the pyramids of Egypt, the water distribution and irrigation systems in Mesopotamia, and the infrastructure expansion in Greece and Rome. So even though we weren't calling it systems engineering as a separate discipline, the underlying principles of uh, requirement flow down and subsystem development were in use prior to this as well. In the second interval, which we refer to as the exploratory phase, system gen engineering in, in uh, the aftermath of World War II did develop as a separate discipline. However, it was mostly used as a management technology to make sure that milestones were met, uh, and it was a very process-oriented approach, and it was used to solve problems. And that's when we started seeing formal definitions and formal research of the field. Interval 3 up till the present day has been defined by the foundation of INCOS to provide a platform for researchers to collaborate. It's been grounded in management but also driven by requirements to make sure that the product requirements are met at the end of the day. And the interdisciplinary approach has increased between the different disciplines of engineering. The histogram on the left shows how influential the foundation of INCOS has been to academic systems engineering research. You see the number of publications just take off after that year of 1990, and it's continuing to increase. And the graph on the right shows how systems engineering is still mostly focused on engineering, although computer science, math, and physics, as well as earth sciences are also starting to integrate it. But definitely the central focus is still uh, engineering, core engineering. 
A key early player in the systems engineering was the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, which was actually founded to create the radio proximity fuse for World War II. And to do this, employed a version of the systems engineering process. It works in a broad range of defense areas, and it's been very successful so far since its founding. APL's chief engineer, Conrad Grant, published a paper looking back at the history of APL and trying to break down why he thinks it's been so successful. And he identified the diverse talent pool, the culture, the deep understanding of operational needs across the domains that it operates in, the cross-functional knowledge of its staff, and the familiarity with te emerging technologies as factors that really contributed to it remaining one of the top players in systems engineering and engineering in general. Um, it's interesting to note in the paper that APL currently has two streams of systems engineering. They have a traditional framework and they have an agile systems engineering framework. And we'll, it'll be interesting to see if in the future these uh, cross into one integrated approach. The approach of APL in general is a spiral approach because they work on longer term contracts um, to generalize. So they start with the critical needs that the customer requires. They perform a capability assessment to see what you know is currently on the field. Then they explore different concepts and prototypes, uh, make sure that the prototypes work at you know showing some promise at meeting the needs. They implement the solution and they deploy it. But the important thing here is it's a spiral. So in order to keep the system relevant, they have to continue iterating and making sure that the system is meeting the current needs of the customer. NASA has also been instrumental to the development of system engineering in aerospace and defense because of the wide range of its projects uh, and the influence that it has across these industries. The Johnson Space Center conducted an experiment to improve their SE process um, using the Morpheus project, which was trying to create a planetary lander testbed to test technologies on for future missions. On this chart, you can see on the top the traditional NASA project life cycle and on the bottom the Morpheus project life cycle, which relied heavily on rapid prototyping, iterating, testing, updating, and then building a new prototype. As part of the Morpheus project, NASA listed out the different work products of systems engineering and how they relate to each other. Uh, a lot of the project actually dealt with enabling the infrastructure to enable these data items to move around. So they actually implemented Microsoft SharePoint to allow teams to link to the different data sets and reference each other. They also found that it's really important not to forget that systems engineering is about creating a elegant work product. And so the four questions on the right are those that they came up with to make sure that systems engineering doesn't just become about defining more and more processes, but rather coming up with better and better products. A key finding was getting the NASA Morpheus team engineers to adopt systems engineering and buy into it. And this graph shows a matrix about how the Morpheus leadership team went about convincing everyone to buy into the SE process and make the project successful. From the literature review that was conducted, a number of future trends in systems engineering could be extracted. And these four are listed. We'll go a little bit into detail about each one and see where the field is headed in these domains. There's a big push currently underway to reuse systems engineering work products. And in order to do this between projects, it's very important to have a framework. And so some studies have been conducted in trying to develop this framework. Normally it's been very software centric, but a study by Fortune and Virality tried to integrate hardware designs and results of processes into this framework to reuse work products. Integrating advanced manufacturing capabilities of today is a key to leveraging their benefits to the system engineering process. This includes things like 3D printing, additive manufacturing, especially of metal and leveraging advances in material science. These things won't improve systems engineering until they're integrated into the workflow. And that's the, currently the work being underdone. A large part of current literature is actually about how to integrate model-based systems engineering. And that basically means using 3D models, modeling and simulation, and advances in these fields to create a digital model of your physical system prior to having to build a physical prototype and using that early data to improve even early prototypes. And the graph shown shows the relationship between how data can move back and forth and improve the efficiency greatly for the overall timeline of the project. Workforce training is gonna be really important to making sure that these new advances are integrated into the workforce. 
as we mentioned, new frameworks for reusing systems engineering products, the manufacturing techniques and model-based systems engineering, these will need to be trained into the workforce in order to make sure that they're being used by the engineers that are actually doing the systems engineering. During the literature review, a few opportunities for research were identified. One of these was the opportunity for cultural inclusivity in the research. The majority of the research work is centered on American applications of system engineering. Uh, there are a few studies by the European Space Agency, ESA, but there should be more work done on this, especially considering the fact that international projects like the International Space Station take place ac across countries and cultures and are based on systems engineering as well. And so more research on how that affects the process would be valuable. Uh, the second was the protect nature of several defense case studies, not releasing how the project actually went. There were a few high level ones, but these were a little too vague to be too valuable. Uh, and so if a company in the defense industry is trying to implement some of these processes, it would be recommended that they do their own internal review at least to make sure that uh, it's applicable to what they're looking for. And the third was research spanning domains and organizations. So for example, a company in aerospace could look to how someone, some company in automotive or computer manufacturing has conducted systems engineering and see if there's some cross domain transfer that can happen there in terms of how it's done uh, and organizations as well. So the research done by NASA uh, pretty much centered just on NASA and it would have been valuable to compare how they're doing stuff to ESA or Japan um, and kind of get that input as well. A few implications for college education for systems engineering that were extracted were systems engineering should be taught at the undergraduate level as it's practiced in the industry. This means not always following the linear flow, but also integrating the fact that you're going to be on a separate team responsible for a subsystem and not the entire system. So that could be um, an opportunity for universities. In addition, the focus on communication skills, including technical email writing when you have to communicate test results or how to handle conflicts between subsystem teams, uh, things of that nature would be valuable to have lectures on that from experienced professors. And the third thing was continuing to expose students to new technologies, because during the literature review, one of the things that the companies look for in college new hires is that new perspective that they're bringing and infusing into their systems engineering process. So just continuing to do that, whether it's through lectures or, or outreach or entrepreneurship would be, would be valuable. On the industry side, the recommendations include continuing to infuse working knowledge of new tools amongst its workers, whether that's through formal training or informal, informal on the job training. There will be a few organizational changes required, whether it's how teams are structured, how management is reported to, or how infrastructure is built, for example, how data can move between teams to enable the newer kinds of agile systems engineering that are in the pipeline. And the third was having feedback channels for employees to give feedback on how systems engineering is actually working on the field. And if they have any input, uh, then it can be integrated by management. And to conclude, systems engineering has deep roots in necessity, practicality, and achieving project success in the face of highly technical challenges. The integration of new capabilities, especially modeling and simulation, will shape the discipline's future. And how effective that'll be will come down to how companies and organizations formally implement these processes to make sure that they're working at the field level. Thank you.